Wow, lots of people, huh? Mm -hmm. No, it's cool. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Kieran Carey, and I am the interim chancellor of the University of Alaska Southeast. And as you know, this is our first evening at Egan for the 2020 fall term. And it's our very first virtual evening at Egan, which I'm very excited about. Um, as I was listening before we began, some of you were talking about the beauties of Zoom and Zoom does have many amazing things um, that allow us to connect even in these very difficult times. I would just like to say that if we were in the Egan Library tonight, I would want us to all take note of our Cyril George Indigenous Studies Center. As you may know, Kathy Ruddy passed away yesterday and it's been a very sad time for us at UAS because of that. But we're going to continue on in her honor and I'm looking forward to tonight. And at this time, I would like to introduce Frank Seuss, Chair of the Alaska Reads Program and a former Writer Laureate for Alaska. So Frank, it's up to you to introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, and let me begin with a number of thank yous that uh, I need to get out there to, to explain how we came to be where we are right now. Um, I want to thank the Alaska Center for the Book. They have been a host, uh, a welcoming host for Alaska Reads from the inception. And they do more than simply host us. They write grants. Uh, the wonderful Lila Vaught uh, wrote the grant to the State Library that got us our, all of our copies of um, Find the Good. And Patience Fredrickson at the State Library expedited that grant, got a wonderful stack of books because Algonquin Books, Heather's publisher, has been amazingly generous in making this event happen. They gave us uh, our books at a very discounted price, so we have many, many books which is good because we have many, many uh, libraries wanting to be part of this event, more than we've ever had. So that's terrific news. We have some uh, important cash support from the Usabelli Foundation, and of course, significant support from the Alaska State Council on the Arts. So all those groups come together, pull together to make this happen, and we are grateful to all of them. We couldn't do this without them. So um, this is kind of a complicated and surprising moment. As we all know, this is the 19th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Centers. And now we find ourselves in another challenging and difficult time. We've got a COVID virus that's uh, wrecking uh, our plans and our lives. We have uh, a country fraught with political divisiveness. And when we began planning for this Alaska Reads, we couldn't have imagined any of this being the case as it would be tonight. However, we had the very good luck of picking Heather Lindy's Find the Good for this occasion. And it turns out we could not have made a better pick. So uh, I think almost everybody in this audience is, is familiar with Heather, but just to make sure, um, you need to be aware that this is Heather's, um, well, Find the Good is her third of four books. And the first two, um, if you live here, I'd know your name. Uh, that one was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, then following uh, that was... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Take Good Care of the Garden and the Dogs. That book uh, actually begins, uh, has a lot to do with Heather's uh, very bad accident on the bicycle and her recovery. And then we get to Find the Good. I'll jump over that very quickly because I want to go to Of Bears and Ballots, her brand new book, which is a book that I would say um, is a wonderful chronicle of the most important thing we can do right now, which is be good citizens. 
Uh, in Heather's case, that means really uh, taking this uh, the extra mile, uh, running for and becoming part of the Haynes Assembly. And in that book, we get a good chronicle of what Haynes Assembly life or any small town assembly life is like. Uh, a fair amount, if I may say so, of sort of tedious meetings to go to and, and fairly small time decisions to be made. But on top of that, of course, Heather uh, suffers a, a recall petition against her. And uh, that highlights some of the divisiveness that we're seeing now. Um, uh, she survived that. And I was amazed to read in the New York Times editorial that she regrets not being on the assembly and running for the assembly again. But uh, maybe we'll hear from her more about that later. So that brings us back around to, to find the good about the most useful and important book we could be reading right now. It's a book that really does uh, show us a way by simply living a life, paying close attention, uh, writing over 500 obituaries, that you learn to look at the world and find good things. Uh, in hearing Heather talk, every time I talk to her and, and I may say something morose, uh, Heather has a way of agreeing, but then finally always bending the conversation towards a positive attitude. Uh, the other wonderful thing about that is that when Heather does it, uh, it's never sentimental, it's, it's emotionally uh, straight on, and it's honest. I mean, she never denies the, the harder, trickier parts of, of problems, too, but she always finds a way to point us towards the good. We need that now more than ever, so I'm looking forward very much to hearing what Heather has to say. So, here we go, Heather. Thank you, Frank. That's very nice. I'm really honored um, to be here and to be the first, and I'm also um, really really pleased about um, find the good being the pick right now when it when it first happened and then 2020 happened I just thought to myself oh no this is terrible <laughs> now I'm gonna have to you know because I'm I'm like everybody else you know I'm hanging on by my fingernails some days and I just think ah and it's um but I but I really do believe that it it is more important than ever right now and I keep thinking that um you know, there's 24 hours in a day, and we're all really good at finding all the terrible things that are happening. And there really truly are very many tragedies, you know, the fires, the, as Frank mentioned, the, the political unrest, the, the issues of social justice and racism, and then the virus and the response and just, you know, floods, famine. It's, it's kind of almost unbelievable. And, and in Haynes, we have bears, you know, we've had a whole the summer of the bears where they're banging into people's kitchens, you know? Um, and it, it's kind of like, what next? And I, I, I really think though, that because, just because everything is so difficult right now and challenging that it, it's more important than ever to at least take part of your day and try to find, you know, something um, good in it or do something good or, or redeem it in, in some way. And um, I know that I appreciate that Frank, you know, noted that it's, it's, you know, 9-11 and, um, you know, I actually, even in the, in the beginning part of Find the Good, I talk about that a little bit about, um, you know, what do you do when, when really bad things happen and how do you, how do you even explain it to children? which of course we're all doing right now because the media is everywhere. It's omnipresent and they're hearing it. They're hearing us talking about it, whatever the, the crisis of the day is. And, um, and, it, and it sounds kind of hokey, but I think we've heard it now several times, but you know, Fred Rogers and that whole idea of look to the helpers. You know, we did that on 9-11. We, you know, people ran into those burning buildings to, to help people. We're seeing it with the fires. People are running to help. I, I saw a, one image that I just saw this morning was a, a tent set up in a parking lot with free lunch and volunteers in the smoke with their masks are, are making food for all these evacuees. Um, 
you know, and we're seeing it in the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, people who are, are privileged and, and white and who um, maybe hadn't realized before walking hand in hand with people who are suffering. And so I, I see I see that happening a lot. And, um, and I think that's part of, it, it's something that we shouldn't forget. And I know that um, when uh, Barack Obama was president and he spoke uh, at one of the memorials for 9-11, I, he, he said sort of the way I, I think about it, he said, you know, the best way we can honor uh, the people who um, lost their lives that day is to be kind to one another, to be nice to people. And, and if you can, be of some service, you know, to your community and, and your, your whatever it is, somewhere, do a little bit. And he called it just a little. And that's why, I mean, in, in another way, that's why I think Find the Good Works for the last read, because it's a little book. It's a little book of a lot of little things. It's not a, it's not a big, heavy thing. And you can sort of take it in, in daily doses. And I, um, I guess I, I should explain how it, how it even came about. And um, um, what happened was, is uh, that I was asked to write a short essay um, that was describing one piece of wisdom to live by. And, um, you know, I, I thought about it, but I, I did not have an easy answer. And I knew I'd made enough mistakes in, in my life to fill a whole bookshelf of do's and don'ts. And I'm reading from the first page here, um, which is called The Good News. And uh, my friend John, and you probably know who my friend John is, it's John Straley. And he works as an investigator in the public defender's office, but is a poet. And this is probably why he managed to distill all his fatherly hopes and dreams into two rules for his only child. Be nice to the dog and don't do meth. And his son turned out kind, clear-eyed, and he graduated from a good college. Um, my trouble was I didn't have such pithy haiku wisdom at the ready. As an obituary writer, I lean toward allegiant couplets, and I have five children, which also adds a lot more variables. One size won't fit all of them. I took another tack. I pretended I was on my deathbed. When I wrote this, I was 54, and I'm, I'm 61 now. And having survived being run over by a truck, and I had a headache, which I worried might be a brain tumor, so this was not a big leap. And I, I, I imagined I'd already said goodbye to my husband and children and grandchildren and all the great grandchildren I hadn't even met yet. And if indeed all the wisdom I had in my heart was to be summed up in final words and say it was difficult to speak more than three, what would I rasp before my soul flew up the chimney? Find the good. And I, you know, I actually surprised myself with that because I didn't, I didn't think that I, um, I didn't realize that I, I knew that. And I think it's come from, as Frank said, a lot of writing obituaries. And when I write an obituary for somebody, I try to, I think about, you know, first of all, what, what well, I always ask the family or friends, you know, what did you love about them? And what did they love? You know, and you'd be surprised even, people that you think might be kind of grumpy or not so great. There's usually somebody that loves them and they have a reason why. And there's usually something that they love to do. And when people start talking about that, it makes them feel better and it, and it makes the remembering better. And, and then, you know, just trying to find in, in each person, what was the good part of that life that's worth sharing. And even the hard parts too, um, you know, contain, uh, contain lessons, I think, if, if I'm going to call them that. Um, uh, I have a note here. I was going to read another little bit. With, with Zoom, I, I find it's kind of difficult to read long pieces of things because then you're, I'm just, you know, looking like this and you're not, I'm not looking at me. So I thought I'd sort of jump around. And, and also this is the thing I like about books right now and reading them and uh, poems and longer or even shorter pieces is, is, is that it's private. You know, you can just dive in like you're jumping in a pond and you're just by yourself and you don't have to like it or not like it or do a smile or a frown or a like, or, you can just 
be there by yourself with it and think about it. And um, you can do that without me reading to you. <laughs> you can do it more privately. Um, but I was also thinking about, um, you know, some of the things I've learned from the obituaries that I've written and what I, what I decided that I wanted to share if I'm going to do just a few of them in this book. And again, it's, these are things that I think also help us right now. And a lot of it has to do with relationships, you know, and being connected. And so I, I really like um, uh, one of the stories in here, um, Stop and Smell the Fish, um, which is about uh, Norm Blank, a, a fisherman and a carpenter. And um, Frank, Frank, um, I mean, uh, Norm sent, I'm looking at Frank and I'm seeing Norm, Norm said an example that I really liked. He, he, his, when I was writing his obituary, um, his wife, Patricia, told me how when the family was growing, Norm quit a perfectly good state job that offered steady pay and retirement benefits because he was being asked to work outside of Haynes. And it would actually have been a promotion, but Norm wanted to have more time at home with his wife and their daughters. And Bonnie Ware, a palliative care nurse, wrote that the greatest regret of most people she cared for, especially men, and, I, and this is gonna change obviously now, um, she was writing probably a couple decades ago, um, was working too much when they could have been enjoying their families. But that was no doubt uh, generational and, and will be much more gentle neutral from now on. The, the, the other regret many dying people shared with her was not cultivating closer relationships. Um, and um, one year, Norm took a break from his usual off-season carpentry work and he packed up the kids in a VW van and he drove across the country. And when he was in his 70s, he'd stop in the cafe in Haynes Mountain Market and he'd turn the chore into an opportunity to meet new folks. He'd, he always did the recycling for free coffee. He just took the recycling from the, from the cafe to the, to the um, recycle center. And, um, and as one of Norman's friends told me, you know, he was just fun to be around. We should all be so lucky, you know, to, to know somebody like that. And I thought after writing that obituary, which was done time, you know, I was really busy and I had kids and I had all these things that I wanted to do. And I just thought, I got to slow down. I got to, I want to be more like Norm. I want to be like that. And of course, you know, you, you try and you start and then you get back into your, your usual um, routines. But, um, and then I'm thinking of um, another obituary that I wrote um, for a, a, a fellow named Clyde Bell. And and this falls into, I think, you know, the idea of finding things and the things sometimes that make people vulnerable are also what connect them to us. And the way that we share those stories with, uh, with, some, with respect, I mean, rather than judgment, because I just think there's a lot of judgment right now on, on every level, <laughs> everywhere we go. If we go to the grocery store, people are judging what's happening. And um, when I was writing, uh, Clyde's obituary, one friend reminded us that when Johnny Cash died, the renter in the apartment above Clyde's store blared Johnny Cash songs out the window for 24 hours. And when the Main Street neighbors complained, Clyde marched upstairs, turned the music even louder, and sat on the couch and listened to those songs until tears streamed down his face. Hanging out with Clyde, another friend said, was a lot like listening to a good country song. He was always sad and he was always laughing. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that kind of caught Clyde too, but I think the end of this chapter is something that I think about that, that might be helpful now to think about, to do before it's too late. Um, I realized, you know, Clyde always kind of said hello and I said, hi, how are you? And we had these exchanges. He talked a lot about, um, you know, the great beyond. He had a son that uh, drowned young and he, he also would look at the contrails in the sky and was pretty sure they were seeding the clouds to change Alaska tundra to wheat producing prairies, you know, um, for when everything goes to hell down south. And he had these ideas and I, and I used to listen and we'd talk and he always wanted me to write a column about him. 
for the Anchorage Daily News to point out what was happening in the world. And um, you can hear my dogs barking. <laughs> I could be a bear going by. <laughs> um, and I wrote at the end of that story that I don't regret not writing a column about Clyde's suspected chemtrails, but I am terribly sorry he died without knowing how much he would be missed. There aren't a lot of people who stop me on the sidewalk to share thoughts about the great beyond or government conspiracies, trusting that I'll listen. Clyde didn't know how I felt about his company, how much richer he made my life with those unusual, brief, thought-provoking chats, because I never told him, except in a have a nice day, see you soon kind of way. Do the other people I care about the ones who may not be in my inner circle, but who contribute to my well-being nearly every day, not know that either? Do yours? What should we do? Be braver and do as the poets and saints advise? String a few kind words together and say them out loud? It doesn't have to be a symphony or a eulogy. A country song will do. You're gonna make me lonesome when you go is plenty. Um, the other thing that's interesting with these times that is new for me is I, I, um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and I've never done that before, but we've had a rainy summer and I ride my bike every morning when I get up and sometimes I just don't want to go out in the windy wet. So I've got my bike on a trainer, but I don't want to listen to the news because that's not very helpful. I think it is actually worse for my heart. It negates all the work on the bike. <laughs> and, and so um, I've been listening to a, a whole different series and it, it seems to be kind of random, but then I wonder, is it really? Um, and am I just tuned in to finding good in these things or is it really coming at us from all directions if we just take a listen? But I listened to one about a, a Harvard study that they've done now for over 80 years where they took uh, uh, Harvard uh, men, and because there was no women back then there, um, a group of them, and then also a group of men from uh, one of the poorest sections of South Boston. And they basically tracked them for, for 80 years in their life, asked, checking in every year and asking them questions to find out what made a, a, a happy life or what made a successful person. And, and it's the longest study of its kind. And um, the uh, basically the conclusions after all this time are uh, relationships, being connected to other people or a community um, or your family. And um, that that in the end made people healthier, both physically and um, emotionally, and in fact contributed to their longevity way more so than um, a lot of the outward uh, trappings of success did. And, um, the other thing that happened then I was, uh, again, randomly, this, these seems, seem to fly in. I was listening to another one uh, from a social scientist who was talking again about um, what makes, uh, how important connection are, is and how important being connected is to uh, people for our well-being. And, you know, in these COVID times when we can't be connected. And she, she said, um, that you know, they concluded that it's super important. But this was the most interesting thing to me. She said that the deepest connections come from when we're most vulnerable. And I thought about that and I was like, yeah, that's, that's why when times are hard and we're all kind of admitting that we're a little bit lost or upset or we're, we're kind of losing it with whatever the situation is, we're, when we're at our most vulnerable is when we make the best connections because we look at each other and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm there with you too right now. What can I do to help? And that's what also happens when you write, when I write obituaries. Um, it's uh, hard to walk into a house where somebody has, uh, you know, someone they love has died. And it's hard for me to go in, but it's even Harder, I think, you know, for people to be vulnerable enough to open the door when, you know, someone might have been sick there a long time and there might still be the hospital bed or the oxygen tank. And, 
you know, there's um, an uncle is sleeping upstairs or cousins that just came in on the plane and people are walking through in their pajamas and there might be dishes around and, you know, they're trusting me to come in and take care of them a little bit then. And it turns out most of the time they take care of me. I, there's very few places that I've ever gone when people are at their worst that that they don't insist on making me a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or giving me cookies. And I'm thinking I'm supposed to be there to help them. So um, those are those are some of the things I, I hope that uh, come out of reading the book and some of the ways that um, might might help us navigate uh, these times as well. So I, 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 I guess I too, I'm kind of glad that it's this book right now. And I, I think if it can help a little bit to get us through the next six months or so, well, that's, that's good. And I don't know if you would like to ask me questions now, or if you want me to read more, I'm really here to do whatever, whatever you'd like. pretty quiet out there. If there's a question in the chat, even I can, uh, I can answer it if you want to. And I can, and really I'll answer any question if you want to know about writing, if you want to know about the book, if you want to know how my family's doing. <laughs> Heather, I just enable people to be able to unmute themselves. Oh, okay. Someone would like me to read another excerpt. Okay, I will. I haven't, um, I, I typically haven't done that in a lot of the events, but um, this book really lends it to it. Um, I could, I really like the, um, the, the ending of the book and maybe I'll just read that whole little section. It, it's only, again, that's what's uh, nice about this book. They're, they're all really separate small pieces that have really been distilled down to, uh, a lot of important stuff, I guess. And I, I owe my editor, Amy Gash, who I work with on all of my books. Um, at one point, this book was about 350 pages. And, and she said, cut it in half. I was like, what? How can I do that? And usually I'm a bit of a waffler, as you can tell. But when I had so few words to use, I really had to do it. And she gave me the confidence to say what I thought in a lot of this. But um, anyway, this is the last uh, chapter of the book, and it's called uh, Make Your Own Good Weather. My husband is reading a book about a man adrift in a life raft, which got us talking about being stranded on a desert island. Chip asked, if I could only bring five things to eat on the island, what would they be? I said, coffee, cream, raspberries, brown rice, and red wine. Pretty soon we were choosing what device, which author, and which musician we would need to have along to survive the ordeal emotionally. I said my iPhone, Mary Oliver, or maybe Emily Dickinson, and Bach. You never listen to classical music, Chip pointed out. You like country songs. Well, this would be an opportunity for growth, I said thinking I should also expand my appreciation for poets beyond New England women. Then he acquired in his logical left brain way, how would I charge the phone? I started to say that's not the point. This is just pretend. I mean, don't those smartphones of GPS's tracking systems anyway? And instead sounding snippier than I intended, I said, can I pack a little more and stay for six weeks? It was almost 10 p.m. and I was tired. My days and nights had been revolving around a 17 month old. Our granddaughter Lonnie is staying with us temporarily. Her parents are in Anchorage, 800 miles away, waiting for her little sister to arrive. Labor began a week ago, too early, at 33 weeks. It has stopped now, but doctors are doing their best to keep the baby inside the womb and stoli near the neonatal intensive care unit for at least three more weeks. You may remember that there's no hospital in Haines. It could be longer. Term is about 40 weeks. Today, Lonnie's cousins, Ivy and Caroline, spent the afternoon with us. The floor is sticky and there's a playpen in the living room, a high chair in the kitchen, and I have sprained my ankle again, stepping on a block. The dog, 
Pearl is having a grand time pulling the stuffing out of a plush moose. It's also mid-August, one of the busiest months in Chip's busiest season. From April to September, my husband's lumber yard earns our family's income for the year, so he can't help out as much as he'd like. If anyone dies right now, someone else may have to write the obituary. It's impossible to type with the child on my lap. I've tried, but I'm saying a lot. Lonnie thinks row, row, row your boat is a fine tune. My plan is to distract her into forgetting her fear of water. She is filthy. We dug potatoes today. Lonnie cheered each time we found one and then she dropped it in our pail. She was so impressed by this ordinary wonder that I furtively reburied the spuds I found so she could pull them from the soil herself. Afterward, when she refused to sit in the bath water, even with the song, and I worried she'd slip and fall standing in the soapy tub, I stripped down and climbed in with her. To her surprise, and mine, it worked. I had to dry and dress her first so she wouldn't catch a cold, and before I knew how it happened, I find myself standing at the desk turned changing table in the den turned nursery, naked. Thank God my life is not a reality TV show. Even though my overarching guideline for grandchild care is what I want their mothers to see this on videotape. I have since hung a robe in the bathroom. I am caring for this baby with every fiber of my being, hoping that by keeping little Lonnie safe, healthy, and content, the sun will shine on her mother and soon to be sister. We open Lonnie's curtains each morning and note if it is fair or stormy, clear or foggy, if the tide is high or low. I tell her there's no such thing as bad weather, thanks to our rain gear and rubber boots. We listen for the roosters and pearls jingling collar tags. We never watch cartoons. We stare at the drifting clouds, the waves, and the ants in the sand. We read stories. Lonnie won't sleep at night without Goodnight Moon. The story reminds me of an obituary I wrote for a 20-year-old who died of complications from congenital cerebral palsy. Jeremy talked with a voice output device by dialing up digital recordings of sentiments he wished to express. The school superintendent recorded, hey dude, step aside, I'm coming through. And Jeremy replayed it as he guided his motorized wheelchair down the hallway between classes. Despite his disabilities, the superintendent told me, Jeremy had a terrific outlook on life. He was certainly a great example for all of us. When Jeremy died, his mother was so devastated that she could not speak to me. She requested that we correspond in writing for the obituary. I slipped my initial questions through her vestibule door. How did he die? I wrote. She wrote back, the cat came and clawed at my bed. I woke up out of a dream in which I was reading Goodnight Moon to Jeremy. Got up, stoked the wood stove, went to check on Jeremy. He had just departed. Good night, moon and sun and stars. My last note from Sherry about Jeremy arrived after the obituary had been published. She thanked me for exchanging notes the past week or so. Heather, you are part of this too. She wrote this, but I read life, love, loss, us. This is why I insist on finding the good, because I know some truths which have been shared with me by people at their most vulnerable, when their hearts are so exposed and raw that it takes all their energy to compose a few lines and pass a note under a closed door into my waiting hand. As an obituary writer, it's my job to be part of Jeremy's death and to help his mother remember her son's life. But as a human being, I know that once hands are clasped, it doesn't matter who did the reaching and who responded. The comfort is in the pressure of palm on palm, of heart to heart. The same day our daughter Sarah and her husband announced that the child who would be called Caroline was on the way, I met with the family of a teenager who had drowned while canoeing. It was Mother's Day. The parents had split up a few months earlier and the boy's mother was moving away. The father sat on the couch holding his new girlfriend's hand. 
The living room was full of boxes filled with clothes and household items and sacks for the Salvation Army and the dump. Photos of the son were scattered across a table and were being selected by his sister for a poster at the memorial service. Each time I asked a question, either the father answered and the mother contradicted him, or the mother answered and the father said, no, that's not correct. I don't think they even agreed on the date of his birth. My questions became shorter, their answers briefer. Then it was quiet. I'd only been there about 20 minutes, but I stood up to leave saying I was so sorry again. That's when a silver haired old woman came from the kitchen with mugs of tea and a plate of cookies and insisted I stay. Everyone sipped and crunched. Then the old woman said the boy had played the piano, that he had a dog and his parents nodded and wept and remembered enough to fill an obituary. This is what I do. Rocking Lonnie back to sleep at 2 a.m., I feel her heart beating against mine, recall my own baby's snuffling warmth, and I'm hit by a blue wave. The undertow of time is strong. I'll never float this way again. Neither will any of us. It's not make-believe at all, is it? So what do you plan to take on your one-way trip to the desert island? Who do you want rowing with you in that life raft? I know I don't want to be cast away with someone who talks all day long about the hazards of falling overboard, eating raw fish and skin cancer, who asks, why didn't you pack sunscreen instead of red wine? That will not be helpful. There's a reason the band continued to play as the Titanic sank, and I think it's been much maligned. I'm going down with the horn section swinging when my time is up. Also, I've decided that whenever, wherever I'm going from here, I'd rather not be in an open raft on an endless sea, even with plenty of coffee and raspberries. Is it okay if I change the raft to my grandmother's dream boat of a vintage Chrysler? There are wide bench seats along with plenty of leg room and an AM radio with the baseball game on. She was a Pirates fan. I've already got the window rolled down and I'm pointing out all the good things I can see from here. And I'm not driving. Something bigger than me is steering this rig. Pearl is on the floor with her soft head in a grandchild's lap. I'm wedged in the back too, amid the car seats, singing about the Big Rock Candy Mountain and changing cigarette trees to cinnamon trees, and just one more gray hair away from ditching my baseball cap and backpack and buying a wide-brimmed red straw hat and matching alligator bag, which I will stock with dog and teething biscuits, bright shiny objects of distraction, curiously strong peppermints, and a huge first aid kit. If I were to die tomorrow, would my grandchildren recall anything I've shown them about love and happiness? Would they even know what find the good means? They're too young for me to explain that yet. But I wonder if somewhere inside their brand new silly putty hearts, there's an imprint of what I wish for them that will endure. Maybe that's a lot to ask. It's plenty good that one loves the stars in the night sky, the other pulls open the curtains and greets the day as soon as she wakes, and a third has learned to unlatch the gate and run ahead of me to the ocean. Even if they don't recall one funny line from a story we read together, or that warm egg we carried so carefully from the chicken coop to the kitchen, I bet they'll remember the fake front tooth that is our little secret. And now you know it too. <laughs> this is what's so odd about writing. My sisters have never seen me smile without it. But when I pop it out, it makes all the grandbabies laugh. And though I still wish I had that original tooth, what's not good about that? So I will wake early to work while the house is quiet. When baby Lonnie calls from her crib, I'll help her let the morning sun in singing, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day. I'll change her diaper and find a dress her mother packed for her. It's just you and me, kid. I'll say as I pin back her curly black hair and to the dog, out of the diaper pail. Looking for the good may be part nature, but it can be nurtured. I believe that with my whole heart. I've learned it by writing obituaries, raising a family, and living in a small town. Find the good, praise the good, and do good, 
because you are still able to, and because what moves your heart will remain long after you're gone and will turn up in the most unexpected places, maybe even clutch tightly in the dirty little hand of a child running along an Alaskan beach. Everyone has heard of hearts turning to stone, but stones can turn into hearts too. I know because I've gratefully accepted those heart-shaped rocks, dusted them off, put them in my pocket, and carried them home. So, how's that? <laughs> That's a story. <laughs> I know, it makes me, sorry, sometimes when I read what I'm even, what I've written, it makes me cry, and all those kids were just here tonight, and time passes. God, it really is just a blink, because now those same little children that that really just seems like a moment ago. We're here tonight and Caroline actually was on KHNS with me this afternoon. She's been doing my country show with me. She's 10 going on 15 and um, Ivy and Lonnie were running around and they're both, I don't know, seven or eight now. <laughs> and then Sylvia Rose, the little baby, she's, uh, well, we just say Sylvia Rose, it's how she goes. She's a real spitfire and she just turned seven, because um, this was all happening right about now. And then they have a little brother, Teddy, who is big enough to call me Mimi now. So that's just this bunch. And there's still more in Juneau and, and, and in Australia. So it really is brief, our, our time here. And, our, and we might as well try to do something good with it, I think. Anyway, questions. Let me see what we've got here. Um, Let's see, how has, recall for us the time in your life when you knew you would or should be a writer. Um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't one of those kids who grew up thinking I was a writer. In fact, I, I didn't think I was good enough to, to be a writer. I, my, you know, I sometimes worry about my punctuation and my grammar. My mother was um, uh, very much a, you know, intellectual, um, American scholars, you know, were at the house and uh, she was um, a teacher and a linguist and spoke a bunch of languages and uh, her sister was a professor. Everybody, they were the, and my sisters were more academic than I was. Um, I was just playing outside a lot. But I like to tell stories and I was a talker, you know, at the dinner table and that's what my dad did. He just would tell stories there. You know, I, we learned all about when he was a little kid and all the different stories of Bentley Avenue Bulldogs because he lived on Bentley Avenue in Jersey City. Um, we learned about, you know, uh, all the time he got kicked out of school because he told the truth because he'd been drinking and, you know, all those, he, he told us a lot of stories. And um, uh, what happened was when I came to Alaska, then I started writing letters home to my mother. And she said, you know, these are pretty good letters. You might want to save them. And that, that was really all the encouragement I needed to think, well, I, I guess I'm observing okay. And my handwriting isn't very good, so I could kind of slur over in case I'd spelled something wrong or didn't, didn't put the right punctuation in. Semicolons are still the bane of my existence. Um, but um, then I went to work at uh, KHNS, the radio station, when I came to Haynes uh, doing the uh, basically the morning section with uh, morning edition and we did a little music breaks in between and then everybody who worked there had to produce a feature once a week and I ended up doing these uh, slice of life pieces from Haynes two to three minutes for Friday's newscast because then they could hold over till Monday and um, they went you know statewide and then and then nationally and uh, and then eventually um, I was asked to do a column in the Anchorage Daily News by George Bryce. And I said, George, I, I don't write really. I just write freehand and I read it and I kind of edit as I'm talking. And he said, oh no, you'll be fine. You can do it. And we did our, our deadlines were all two weeks ahead. So I had lots of time. And George really helped teach me the, the craft of it and was very patient, kind with me. Um, and so was Kathleen McCoy there. And then an editor, uh, uh, well, then, they, then the radio pieces also ended up um, you know, going um, nationally. And uh, my same editor, Amy Gash at Algonquin, heard um, one of them 
on the radio in New York and called me up and asked me if I wanted to write a book. And that's what came of If You Lived Here. And she's still my editor and they're still my publisher. And I've been really lucky. Um, and I, I've i gotten better at writing and more nervous at talking, but my writing still is written in a in a way that I think it mostly sounds like talking. And everything I write, I read out loud before I uh, hit the send button or say it's good enough for now. So that's that's how that happened. Um, and I'm not sure, is it, do you want me to read the chat or do people want to talk to me? Does anybody have a preference there? No, read the, just do the chat and answer the questions. Would that be okay? I'm seeing Frank nod his head. Um, one of the questions was uh, how has writing obituaries changed your other writings? Um, has it in any way or influenced or changed your thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's changed my whole life. I carry around a lot of grief sometimes. And sometimes I think I can't do it anymore. Um, you know, you kind of absorb that and, uh, and, it, and it comes out sometimes in, in different ways, but I think it, it um, definitely makes me, um, especially in my writing, when I'm, when I'm actually thinking about what it is I really want to say when, you're, when you've written a lot of obituaries for a lot of people that you know, uh, it, it, it tends to make you nicer. You know, after a funeral or, or uh, a wake, people are, um, are, tend to be pretty uh, nice to each other. And they'll say afterwards, you know, I'm gonna do better. But that happens to me like every, you know, at least once a month sometimes. So I'm, I'm always kind of got that fresh off of uh, death feeling. So I think it, it's got to influence. Um, the way that I write, and I and uh, and, it, and it influences my whole life. Um, and uh, what's the other one? Let's see another question. Um, oh, the status of the movie of my book. Um, it, it's not actually a movie. Uh, it's a television show, <laughs> and it's not reality TV. And it's um, a semi-fictional drama. Uh, is the plan? anyway, based on my books, uh, and two of them only, uh, If You Lived Here and um, Find the Good, this one. And there's really no status right now. The, there's a, an option on them, but everything has kind of stopped. There was one script and then another. It was sort of fun to write them. Uh, very interesting uh, process. I, I agreed to it because none of the names would be real, uh, including mine or my family or anybody in town and it would be fictionalized. And the people who um, proposed it and who have the rights to it were behind um, Call the Midwife, that series, they're British and that, and that was based on a, a non-fiction uh, memoir series too. So I felt comfortable with that, but uh, who knows if anything will happen. And that happened out of the blue too. Actually, the woman who produced Call the Midwife sent a, um, uh, an, an email to me and asked if anybody had the television rights, and I said, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the status of that. And um, what did I end up editing out of this book? That's a really good question. I don't know, because I don't save my outtakes. I know some writers do. Uh, but I figure if it's, if it's not good enough, then it's gone. And if it was really that good, I should be able to bring it back. So it just, I'm pretty brutal when I'm editing myself. Um, I just get rid of stuff and get it down to where it is and, and hope that I can generate other material again uh, the next time. Um, how often do you write? And do you do a lot of planning before you start writing? I really don't do any planning before I start writing. I find um, that in that way, uh, I'm, I'm really am an essayist. I start writing and then it kind of 
takes me along until I get to where I, I ought to be. And then I go back and I get rid of most of the stuff that didn't get me, that I don't need to get there. <laughs> Even when I, I wrote columns for the Daily News, I would often write a, an 800 word column might start out at 5,000 words and I just go back and because I was on a deadline, just look at it and say, okay, this goes, this goes, this goes. Um, rarely, sometimes there might be two columns in there. I might realize that there's something else um, that I could use or another story, but mostly um, uh, I, I figure out what it is as I go along and it, and it unfolds. Really the planning, if there is that, is all in the editing process. I write a whole bunch of stuff and then I take a look and I, I pull things away and, and I'm pretty brutal when I, when I edit. And in any book that I've done, it's, it's the, the free writing part is pretty quick and the, the editing uh, could, could be two years of working three or four hours a day on it. Um, and uh, what do you do when um, the people's stories are larger than an obituary? Do you compile them and share them with families? Sometimes I do. Uh, usually what I'll do if, if I'm taking good notes is if I have a whole bunch of notes and there's a lot of information, I'll, um, I'll clean them up you know, uh, spell check them and put them in order and try to make some semblance. And I'll give them to the family, especially things that people have said that don't, don't make the obituary, that'll make them feel better about that person or to know what, what people told me. Um, sometimes, especially uh, if there's more information, I'll help with the eulogy, which will often be a lot longer than an obituary. And I'll even, I've even written them uh, in the voice of the family member that's doing them. And in some cases, I've, I've delivered them with the material that I've gathered uh, for the obituary. So um, sometimes it just really depends on, on how much time I have and, and if the family wants that or if, if it would be helpful. Um, and thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Lucy loved the story. And uh, the question is, have you ever considered publishing a book of your ADN columns? No, I haven't, you know, and I don't even know where they all are um, because the Daily News went through different um, incarnations, you know. My, my favorite thing in the whole world, if I picked what I, what I like to do more than anything is write columns, and it's in particular to write like a weekly column, which I was always told never say yes to that, but I find it to be so forgiving and you can really build a rapport. And I, I know this is old fashioned, but I prefer I prefer one more step of, uh, I guess it's kind of formality from say a blog or an unfiltered or an unedited. I like the structure of a newspaper, you know, because you don't put everything in the paper or it's not a literary journal with more heart in it. It's a, it's a kind of interesting thing and it's a very um, egalitarian, like you have this you have this writing sitting there in the middle when people are between the sports pages or the obits or the or the news or the ads or the editorials and then there's this thing that I don't know what my columns were they weren't really quite they're like little mini essays that are just sitting there when they least expect it that doesn't say you know whoa listen to this but it's um a way to uh, connect that I I really liked um Is uh, there a book that you have wanted to write but have never yet gotten the energy to undertake? Um, there's one that I think about that's rolled around in my head a few times that I might uh, undertake sometime. Uh, it's about, um, now I'm gonna forget her name, Eliza. Uh, I don't remember her last name now, but there was a woman um, who was a, uh, travel writer, one of the first members of the National Geographic Society. She wrote uh, travel columns coming to Alaska. She, she knew John Muir. She was here in the, somebody might know her name. She was here in the turn of the century in Alaska, but she, um, she also traveled all around the world and um, she's responsible for uh, the cherry trees in Washington, DC. And I just, 
And um, when she died, um, all of her letters were uh, burned because uh, of, uh, I think, a, a romantic um, uh, uh, connection with a woman that in those days that wasn't okay. And um, so she had all of her personal letters destroyed. And it, so it's kind of, it would be one of those sort of novels um, that you re reconnect through her published writing. And I've always thought that that might be a kind of a challenge for me because it would be sort of like a big obituary being a, a biography of somebody, but there'd also have to be a lot of creative writing involved because I just didn't know that much about her life. But it also takes place in my area so that I'm familiar with the places where she was. So, oh, Eliza Skidmore, thank you. <laughs> I know I should have, I wasn't expecting that question or I have her written down, but I'm kind of fascinated by her. And if I ever feel like I'm going to take on a long project, that might be, that might be one. Um, do I know other people who write obituaries? Actually, you're going to think this is weird, but I'm a member of the Society of Professional Obituary Writers. <laughs> and I even went to one of their conferences um, a long time ago. I've only been to one and it was in Portland um, and uh, it was uh, great. And I got to meet um, several of the uh, sort of legendary obituary um, writers. There's a couple of folks that write for the Toronto newspaper, Montreal newspaper. There's one, um, the, uh, the Washington Post um, uh, obituary writer, uh, Adam Bernstein. He's not related to the Woodward and Bernstein, but he's, um, uh, anyway, I, I, um, and I get their emails occasionally. I, I'm not a very good joiner or clubber, so I don't, um, uh, I don't see them too often, but I also became friends with one of them, uh, Kay Powell, who was a fantastic, uh, obit writer from Atlanta, who's, uh, she's, um, gosh, she must be in her eighties now, but I, I love her obituaries and we do still correspond occasionally uh, and she's uh, pretty terrific. So um, yeah, mostly though, um, and the, of course, I don't, I'm not the only one that writes in for the Chilcot Valley News. I mean, if somebody dies and I'm doing something else or I'm out of town, uh, somebody else does it. So we all kind of talk about it. Different, different people have had different um, opportunities. I helped a, a young woman uh, write one for her friend's mother recently because her, and in Haynes, but her, her friend's mother really, her friend really wanted her to write it for her mother. And I thought, well, I could teach someone else how to do this. And Tia's really um, thoughtful and uh, likes to write. And so I, I worked with her on that one. And that was very enjoyable. Um, have you ever done a meta narrative of your family's history in the spirit of 100 years of solitude? <laughs> Rob Welton, I don't think my family really, I don't know if we would, would merit a, a meta history. I, I, I haven't, uh, no, I haven't thought about that. Um, uh, um, my, my cousin, I don't know if you know this, this is a, a bit of trivia, but my cousin is, um, he does, they're not, they're almost micro histories, but they're novels of a, a family that is oftentimes a lot like ours. And um, his name is, uh, my cousin's name is Stuart O'Nan. I don't know if you know him and Emily alone and Henry by himself. That's kind of, that's sort of close to my mother's Pennsylvania family. Uh, that's where she was from. And um, my grandma that I talked about, we'd spend summers out in Western Pennsylvania with them, but, um, and he writes more uh, novels and, and family sagas, but um, yeah, so far I haven't. I there's a lot to there's a lot to do and not much time. I keep I keep going through it. Um, oh, a friend of mine. Oh, if a friend of yours is researching a book, okay, somebody is uh, doing some of those things. Oh, that was to me privately. I wasn't supposed to say that. So, um, does anybody else have? Um, a question or are we I don't know where we're at here it's eight o'clock I'm not sure how long we're supposed to go I can't hear I'm wondering is there are other people having trouble hearing or 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this is Kenny. <laughs> Hi. So I guess we can go as long as you like. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat that I might be able to pull out for you, or we okay. could start wrapping it up, or whatever, whatever you like. No, if there's more uh, questions in the chat that you'd like me to see. Uh, oh, I see. I go up. I see them. There are. Well, I don't know. Sure. If you can see some that I'm missing, or if anybody else just wants to talk to me, they don't have to send it in the little thing going down the side. I'm happy to. Um, I should be able to unmute yourselves. So, um, oops, maybe not. Maybe I did the opposite. Okay. Now you should be able to unmute yourselves. <laughs> Someone has a, oh, hi. hi. This is from Juno. I just want to thank you for all that you do in Haynes. I have family there. Um, and I just know it's a small town. And I think it's so amazing that you share that positivity. I feel it for a lot of years. It's really hard work. And um, yeah, I just thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> I love your book. It got me through the hardest time of my life. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I know this is kind of weird, this Zoom thing. Uh, part of me, I'm just talking to one person, but if um, anybody wants to ask me anything, I'm, I'm here. Heather, somebody asked in the chat if you've ever mentored anyone, and as someone that you have mentored, I will say yes, she does. But I have mentored you. Have I mentored? I, I don't. I don't think of myself as like a mentor. I just, um, I, 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 I think you're a terrific writer. So I just like to read whatever you send me. <laughs> it's like, I think it's an interesting question. You know, being such a prominent writer in Alaska and certainly in Southeast, you know. Have you worked with young writers or in the schools or with anybody like that? No, you know, you know, I live in Haynes and it's an interesting thing. I, I volunteered, you know, to see if in the school and it's like, you know, I think in my, in your own hometown, uh, no, <clears throat> I, I've gotten, it's interesting. I'll say, I'll think to myself, yeah, I could, maybe I could help some high school kids or something and I'll, and I'll volunteer and I don't get any calls. I tend to spend most of my time in the schools in a, second grade classroom or third grade classroom or kindergartners talking about that and um and that which is very fun i mean i, I love to encourage kids to write I, I think in terms of mentoring you know what i try to do is if, if people talk to me you know to to encourage them to uh I, um you know I'll, I'll read things i'll um i'll suggest where where people can place things. I, um, in general, I just try to be encouraging, but I've never really been in the, uh, the teaching or the, the academic side of it. So pe people haven't asked me to really. Uh, I, um, I, I, I provide a lot of moral support. <laughs> I don't know if I pro how much writing support I provide or if um, uh, people be that interested in that. Heather, this is uh, Jeffrey Loftus, not that that's important, but some time ago, let's see, Lisa Farber asked, have you ever considered publishing a book of your ADN columns? And I think you did respond to that regarding that you're not really sure where they're at or something along mm -hmm. that line. And I, and I understand that. And then I responded that, um, and I misquoted and I called her Lucy, but I've read um, and met and a number of times, Clay S. Jenkinson, North Dakota, and he's, he did that very thing. And it's called For the Love of North Dakota. And I'm not sure if you're going to be, if the chat box is going to be shared with you, but that might be one you want to just, you know, ponder. Yeah, no, I read, I, I read collections of columns all the time, um, especially when I was writing them, just to help me to learn how to write them better. I mean, for me, the best teachers are, are writers. And so I, and they're not really necessarily like my columns, but I do have collections of Anna Quinlan's columns, um, Calvin Trillin, I'm a big fan of his, Molly Ivins, <laughs> read her, even H.L. Mencken. Um, he, he wrote a lot of newspaper columns that um, I've read, uh, Studs Terkel. Um, uh, so I think the difference with mine is that they're so immediate that, um, 
I don't know if they would hold up over time. Uh, sometimes columns are such a snapshot of time and place, and I'm not in the same league with those writers. Um, so I, I, I guess it just never, I never um, have thought about it. But, um, uh, oh, and uh, John Gould, I love to read his columns. I know that Frank is uh, in Maine right now, and he was a, a, a Maine uh, columnist for years for the Christian Science Monitor. And I was a huge fan of his. Um, and then, uh, and his columns have been collected in um, many different forms. I think there's two or three collections that I've read. So I, I, I like them and I see the value of it, but so far no one's ever suggested that I do that. <laughs> well, you know, whatever you think, that, that's the whole thing. It's, it's, it's up to you. I just suggested yeah. Clay S. Jenkinson because he's... Yeah, I'd like to read them. I, I, like, I really like reading columns, so. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Can I ask a quick, quick question, Heather? Sure. Uh, so I met you last year in Tenneke, and I, you, you talked about, and I could probably look this up online, but it's easier to just ask you. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about your, your book about um, the politics of- Oh, Ballots and Bears? Yeah, that one. Yes. Yeah, I, I, want, I haven't read it, and I haven't looked for it, but I, really, a, I want to hear about it again. Just this so. is that one. That, it's this one. Okay. That's what it looks like. And um, it just came out this year, and it's about my uh, three-year uh, term on the Borough Assembly from 2016 to 2019 oh, that's and, in Haines. And um, it actually begins, it opens uh, the first couple, the Tenneke is there. The Tenneke Book Club is there, and being in the, um, the, uh, the bath in Tenneke is a, kind of a part of it, because you know my my campaign manager is Teresa Hira, my dear friend Teresa. <laughs> yeah, she was um, on earlier. <laughs> yeah, and so um, it's about uh, trying to trying to govern a small town, and Haines certainly is known for its contentiousness, and I found out firsthand that it really is. And it was this this story also fits into the timing right now um, that that Frank. Um, uh, mentioned in the beginning that the divisiveness and Haynes is pretty divisive and my term on the assembly uh, was brutal and it, it was for me I think emotionally um, uh, maybe more difficult than getting hit by a truck um, because I, I love this town so much and uh, I was I hadn't I just hadn't seen the the uh, kind of the meaner parts that that is but those are things that are coming out now all over the country um, and in small towns and big cities and medium towns and everywhere. Um, people are, are uh, angry and fearful. And um, what's interesting to me though is uh, that writing about it helped me. And I also, you know, I mean, it, it, it also made it not seem so bad and I, I think too, I guess I don't want to sound like I'm all like serious all the time. I mean, I, the one thing that saves me most of the time is I think I have a pretty good sense of humor. And so that helps, especially with Haynes politics. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a good book to follow, find the good with, because I really had to do it. I, I was sort of tested <laughs> on my own. And at even one point, I, um, more than once uh, in fairly hot meetings, uh, somebody would turn and go, come on, Heather, find the good. You know, if I was upset about something and I just remember thinking, what was I, ah, this is gonna haunt me for the rest of my life. And now I'm like, I'm proud of that. I'm like, oh, you know, I will find it. And, and I just kind of decided that if I have a choice, mean, not mean, I'm just gonna go not mean. And, and I've also realized that in Haynes too, because we are so divided, that we have to figure out a way to um, uh, get back to being close again. Um, and now the whole country is in that same situation where we gotta just figure out how to get along with people that, what well, just, you know, that we just vote differently from or have a different worldview. And we've been doing that forever in Alaska, but all of a sudden it seems like that's, not possible with some some folks anymore and i think that's something we have to just keep working on so i i guess that would be what kind of came out of that book 
And I'm so glad I lived there. Yeah. And so what would you say, like if I haven't read either of those, but I want to, and which one should I read first and which one should, which, which one should follow? (laughs) I I see them all as a continuum. You know, if you lived here and then take good care of the garden and the dogs and then there's find the good and then there's, well, we're back into, I mean, ballots and bears is really almost like the coda to, if you lived here, their books are structured very much the same. And one is sort of finding a home and, in Alaska, and as Emily writes, you know, in, in her book, you know, being like freshly rooted, and all the things that I learned about Haynes through the obituaries, and that was, you know, 20 years ago, and then this is, okay, now I'm a grandma here, and I've got deep roots, and suddenly finding like, whoa, I'm, I'm still here, but now I know it without the necessarily completely rose-colored glasses. They're, <laughs> I still have them for, but, you know, they're a little cracked and taped, <laughs> <laughs> so I you know but it's it's really whatever you want to do but it's nice to see you you too Heather are there uh, any circumstances where you'd consider running for office again oh hi Bruce you know um uh like what Frank's talked about I wrote a little piece about right when this pandemic came out and I said to myself oh, I wish I was on the assembly right now because you know there's these big decisions to make and there's actually finally things that really matter i mean really matter health and you know people's livelihoods and how we keep these towns together and educate our kids and all this stuff there's big things and um but then i uh and and this and even this election time you know said, oh heather you gotta do it again you gotta do it again and i i actually be pretty good at it now better than i was because of the experience but um no i don't i really don't think so because but the minute I, I think I, I got to get in there. I just remember for me, the, um, the weight I felt when I was off the assembly, just lift. It was like, I was like buoyant. I, I, I take in the weight of the world on this. And so I just have to remember, like my daughter even said, when I said this time, I said, Oh, maybe I will just run. Cause you know, I could do this with my eyes closed. Now I know how these means are. She goes, do not, do not. You will be a hundred by the time you do that for three more years, it'll kill you. Because I take everything so to heart. I mean, I don't know, would you ever run for mayor again, Bruce? Oh, I have those fantasies just like you, but yeah. uh, I'm recognized. I'm, I've got 10 years on you. So I figure it's time for another generation. That's what, and that's what I think too, actually. And I wish, and that's what I encourage in Haynes. And I, you know, my kids don't want me telling them what to do all the time. So why don't they, you know, they and their peers figure it out. And I know everybody's busy and I know it's hard, but and it's almost better than if people are busy and they've got busy lives and they just don't have time to obsess over things that, that can turn into these big fights for days and days and days and you just get wrapped around, you know, a rope wrapped around the wheel about nothing. That if people are busy, they just vote and go home and okay, we're done. So I think sometimes uh, if you have more time, you can actually, isn't necessarily a benefit in, in especially advising a manager form of government. <laughs> that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heather, there was an earlier comment in the chat from Lisa Farber asking, can you tell us about your writing schedule and the typewriter behind you? Uh, my, my writing schedule, my ideal writing schedule is uh, I try to, I get to my desk about 1030 and I try to stay till about three. That's if I don't have a particular assignment or a deadline. You know, if I'm on an obituary, it's just whenever. I might be at someone's house Sunday afternoon and come home and type up notes and get up early Monday and get it in so it's at the paper, you know, on the right deadline. Or if I have to talk to someone on the phone or go to their house, I just do it on that schedule. If I'm um, working on a, a book or a column, it, it, it can, ideally a book should still fit into that 1030 to to 2.30 or 3, but, you know, uh, this week I was uh, proofreading um, manuscript that's going maybe somewhere, and I just, I, I was at my desk a lot longer, like six, seven, eight hours a day, sometimes back at night to just get it done, um, uh, and, you know, any, any time on a deadline is just sort of random, but even when I'm not, even when I don't actually have any work to do, I just come up here 10.30, 
two thirty. That's where you know I might be answering emails. I, you know, I might be, <laughs> I might be reading a book. I might be um, blogging a little. But I, I try to just have that habit. That time is reserved for that. With a lot of the stuff lately, that's when I'll answer, you know, calls about different places to go and things to do. Um, in terms of the typewriter behind me, this is a um, Olivetti Laterra 32. And I, um, I, I play with it. I don't really write on it. I write little poems on it. I write journal entries on it. I got it um, when I was on the assembly, actually, because my computer had all business on it and it was starting to be not fun um, to be at my desk. And so I decided first thing in the morning, instead of turn on the computer and see all the, ah, I would just not turn on the computer and type a few, try to write a haiku write a little journal entry, how I was feeling, the weather, and I, I, I use them, I put them in binders that I kept. And that, that was a lot, actually a lot of the notes that were, um, I used for the book were in, in piles that I had typed. Uh, but I also have, I just found I started to kind of like typewriters. <laughs> and so then I got more typewriters and I have, I have another one back there. I have a, um, uh, what is it? It's the, the uh, Royal, and then the Royal Quiet Deluxe, there's two Royals. And I also have another one of these that isn't in as good shape that my grandchildren use when they come. And I have another Royal, an old Royal 1942 or three one that's under the desk here that when the kids come over, I put them on the dining room table and be amazed how children just love to type on them. And um, it's very mechanical and fun and uh, I like to do it and they like to do it. So that's, that's the typewriter story. I don't know if there's anything else or if everybody's tired and wants to, it's dark. <laughs> we're just, we're getting used to that. Um, see if there's something else in there that I can see. I'm gonna sign this off on Oh, okay, Heather, let's see. How are things uh, for you in Haynes after Bears and Ballots book came out? And uh, not on the assembly, that's from my friend Eric. Um, you know, it's it's been fine, actually. Uh, I was, Chip joked that I would, um, you know, was my publisher giving me a one way ticket out of town? <laughs> and um, no, uh, people have been really, um, you know, the people who have talked to me have liked it. Um, as always with any of my books, there are people who uh, wonder why they weren't in it more <laughs> and they wanted to have a bigger part because they may have a bigger part in my life, but it didn't really fit what I was writing about. Um, and uh, there are um, at, the, at the bookstore in Haynes, uh, there was a great story on the radio this week that even surprised me uh, that um, uh, she sold a lot, I, 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 hundreds of copies, and our bookstore w changed hands uh, this winter. Um, and a new owner moved to town and took it over and was renovating it during December, January, February. And she opened like March 1st and then had to close and then opened slowly up. And, and then we had no summer season that usually supplements it. And, she said that my book um, kept the store afloat and people getting it. So that, that really made me feel good. And um, it's also a lot of people are getting the book. A lot of those came from out of town, but a lot of people in town are, are also getting it and sending it to family. There's at least one or two people running for the borough assembly that are running because they read it. And one of them is 33 years old young girl who's the clerk at one of the liquor stores um, and I'm really glad I just endorsed her and another one is a, a Carol Tyneman who's a longtime supporter of the arts um, who decided that she was going to run as well so that's kind of neat I inspired some people that way but I haven't heard really and uh, and the other thing is that I know even um, one of the uh, people that I write about in the book that was in charge of the, uh, the recall, really, that was spearheaded the recall, um, uh, who's, um, I call him Big Don. Um, he, uh, his name is Don, but I call him Big Don in the book. And he, uh, he's been shopping in the lumberyard 
So there's that. Um, this is someone said that they just um, read a novel on, on writer's block and was wondering if I ever had that. Uh, no, I, I, I have writers not enough time. <laughs> I think, or writer's distraction, or whatever, but I think I can usually come up with something if, you know, if I just had another minute, or the day went differently. At the same time, I know my writing all comes from all the distractions, so I, I think actually if I did have all the time in the world, then maybe I would have writer's block if I just had to sit alone by myself and try to come up with stuff. My writing comes from my connectedness to my family and, and uh, community and, and the world in general. If I was just alone in my head, I'm, I, maybe I would. Can you tell us what you're writing now? Uh, you know, um, I haven't been writing so much uh, right now because I've been uh, doing a lot of events for bears and ballots, uh, radio interviews and Zoom stuff. And now we're going into Alaska Reads and that's, <laughs> that's Frank. There's been a lot of organizing there and going back and forth and juggling. Um, what, I, what I did just do, um, which I, I might jinx it, I said, I wrote for my uh, MFA, when I, when I went and got my master's degree, I, I got it in fiction writing at the University of Alaska Anchorage in their low residency program in uh, 20, I have my diploma here, I'm quite proud of it. I think it was um, 20, oh, let me see. Oh God, I can't even, literary arts, 2011. <laughs> it was 2011. <laughs> so, um, and I, I wrote a novel and um, it's, I, I, hadn't really done much with it or knew what to do with it. And so uh, just this um, last, just this week, or the last two weeks, I've been um, revising it some uh, based on some notes that some friends gave me and proofreading it one more time. And um, uh, my uh, agent took it and she's going to try to sell it. So we'll see. I, um, I, I, I don't know. It was kind of, it's been a, it's a good job for me to do for the last few weeks. It kept me busy. Uh, and, and, and it was kind of exciting to see if that happens. I don't know if it'll actually get published. Um, but at least it made it through that, that little wall, uh, which is significant, I think, because that's kind of hard. And I know people say, well, if you've written all these other books, well, fiction is different. And uh, I don't know if it's as good as my other books, frankly. Um, I like it. It's a good story. My kids like it. And it's, um, you know, it's a nice way to spend a rainy weekend. It might not be a Pulitzer Prize winner or anything, but it's a good story. Uh, and, um, and reading it again, I still kind of liked it. So that, that made me feel okay. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see if it, if it goes anywhere or not. But that would be kind of neat. And um, what else? Is there somebody else? Can you tell me again what the name of the nerve you mentioned in Ballots and Bears was where you're holding your heart in your stomach and focus on your breath? It's the vagus nerve you know, that runs through your, um, uh, there's, a, there's a nerve that runs through your center and you can actually kind of, it can make your heart stop if you get too anxious about it. Um, so yeah, I, I practice putting my hand in yoga class, my hand on my heart and on your belly and you breathe. And the trick is, is to um, exhale longer than you inhale. And part of this I actually learned from, um, it's a book called Deep Survival that I read. Uh, I think his name was Dr. Lorenz. I, I should remember the author's name, but it's a really cool book about um, surviving uh, trauma or being lost in the wilderness. And I was very curious about why I survived my bike wreck. And um, it's all sort of the, um, the actual physiological things that happen when you are literally scared to death and you're also physically injured. And that was one of the things that 
that you should practice if you get in a situation that is either, you know, really tough or you're lost or scared is that whole idea of inhaling um, deeply and then exhaling longer and counting. Like if you inhale at six, count to 10 on the exhale. So I had to try that sometimes on the burrow assembly because I was <laughs> thought I might tip over from the anxiety of it. Um, so I think that's, uh, I think I've kept you all long enough on a Friday night. I, I hope, I hope this has been helpful to you. And I, I'm, I'm kind of sorry we're not in that beautiful Egan library, but it's also really nice just to be sitting at home with everybody because we probably all wouldn't be there if we had to get out tonight, right? Yeah. Thank you, Heather. This has been terrific. And you have, uh, been very gracious as always. It's been great. Thank you, Frank. And you have too. I know that you're up late there in May. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and I also just want to let everybody know I'm easy to find. You know, you can email me if you just Google my name, you go to heatherlandy.com. If you have any other questions that I didn't answer or uh, you just want to say hi, that's, that's where I am. Thank you so much, Heather. Kenny asked me to just sort of say good night to everyone and to just really offer you a huge thank you for the generosity of spending all this time with us. And you're so wonderful to answer questions and encourage all of us writers. And we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much for being thank with you. us. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. And I did, I just too, I guess I should, before I just go, I do really want to encourage, I know there's a lot of students, a lot of your students are here, a lot of people that just want to write. And I think, um, you know, the, the, more, the more stories that are out there um, that we're all telling about our lives, that's another way to connect with everybody. And so it's not, there, isn't, there aren't any that are more important or less important than the others. All of them are. So if you think that you're, oh, I'm not good enough or not worthy enough or whatever, um, you are. And, uh, and, and keep at it because, um, you, you know, we all have stories to tell and we all have um, lives to share. And the more we do that, the more we stay connected. And I think um, going back to that image of us all being in an emergency room right now with uh, that Anne Lamott said, that's how we should treat each other. And, you know, the first thing that happens when you, when you go to an emergency room is, you know, they want to know your story. What's your name? Where are you from? How do you feel? Um, you know, um, what can we do for you? And those are kind of the questions you answer when you're writing. <laughs> and and um, that's the best way that we can take care of each other right now is to share our stories and then to read and listen to other people's stories. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. And thank you, Frank, for um, bringing Heather to us and for all of you for joining us. We're really thankful that you could be with us at UAS, even as we're on our own separate islands tonight. Okay, and thank you. Thank you all for um, coming. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope you take care of yourself and, and if you're able to take care of somebody else a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you, Heather. All right, bye-bye.